Free trade and globalization were going to make everything better because they would harness the wonders of competition and drive efficiencies. Those were the arguments back then. But as former CIBC World Markets chief economist and author Jeff Rubin now argues, it ruined the middle class instead. He makes that case in his new book, The Expendables, how the middle class got screwed by globalization. And he joins us now from the Annex in downtown Toronto. Jeff's good to see you again. How are you managing through this pandemic? It's good to see you, Steve. I'm doing just fine. Although it looks like you might need a bit of a haircut, my friend. What do you think? It's been a while, but, you know, <laughs> got to observe social distancing. I get you. Uh, let's start off right away with the title of the book, The Expendables. Who are they? Well, they're, uh, I guess, uh, statistically, if you want to, you know, talk about Canada, there are people who make between 29400 and 78400 median income of just under 40000 That's how the OECD defines the middle class, and that's the income range for Canada. It's slightly different for other countries. But not to be statistical, it's people who, uh, you know, used to have their own home, used to go on a family vacation once a year, people who maybe put away a little bit for their kids' education. They're becoming a vanishing breed, at least in countries like Canada, both as a percentage of the population, as a percentage of household spending. In the U.S., they're now the same as what the top 5% would represent. And they're getting a lot older because uh, what we're finding is that, you know, while 70% of people like us, baby boomers, are middle class, it's 60% for millennials, 50% for Generation X. And, and unlike in our case, when you got into the middle class, it was pretty well a lifetime gig. Today, it's very precarious. I mean, you know, for every one person that goes up from the middle class, two go down. And every five years, one in seven of middle class households become the working poor. That's not uniquely a Canadian number. That's pretty well across the OECD. Let's do a quote from the book to continue the discussion. It used to be, you write, that having a middle-class job meant you owned a home, went on an annual family vacation, and put away a few dollars each year for the kids' education. But that was a long time ago. In today's global economy, things are different, very different. Getting a job once offered many people a route out of poverty. Today, most of the jobs being created are a gateway into it. And once you cross through that gateway, chances are you aren't crossing back. I mean, it, it, it very much echoes what you just told us, but, uh, you know, I, I, I understand that you could tell us in an hour how all of that happened. We don't have an hour, Jeff, so why don't you give us the Coles Notes version of how that happened? Okay, well, anybody, you know, working for Uber or Lyft knows exactly what I'm talking about. It's not that we haven't had employment. We've had spectacular employment. In fact, prior to COVID-19, most countries, including Canada, we're for all intent and purposes at full employment. What we haven't seen is any real wage growth. I mean, real wages in Canada and the United States peaked in about 1975. That's, you know, that's a hell of a long time to go without a wage increase. When I was taught economics, uh, there was a thing called the Phillips curve. And it looked at the relationship between the unemployment rate and wage growth. So as we got to full employment, wages started to accelerate because workers, of course, would go on strike. And strikes were costly when the economy was strong. Only problem today is it's kind of hard to go on strike when you don't belong to a union. Back in their zenith, the 1950s, one of every three private sector workers in the U.S. belonged to a union. Today, it's one out of every 20, and, and that decline is across the board, UK, US, Germany. And for the few unions that still remain, going on strike is pretty suicidal, because if you do that, chances are at midnight, a fleet of trucks come on a giant repo operation, haul away all the machinery they can to some new plant that's being opened up in Mexico, and the plant that you worked at for the last 30 years has just permanently been sold and is slated to become a high-rise condo development. That's why the Phillips curve doesn't work anymore and ain't going to work until workers get some bargaining power. 
Now, to be sure, most of the unionized growth has only happened in the public sector. Would you argue that society as a whole would be better off if we had much more unionization in the private sector as well? Well, it depends what you mean by society. I mean, if I'm a shareholder in Magna or GM, probably not. But if I'm a member of Unifor, yeah. But I'm saying if you want to understand why 80% of Canadian households have not seen real income growth in the last two decades, despite full employment, this is a pretty good starting point, as good a starting point as any. It, you know, I mean, in the old days, GDP growth meant, you know, a rising tide lifts everybody's boat. Today, GDP growth is very exclusive. I mean, for most people in the economy, they don't see any of the benefits of GDP growth. So, so hence, maybe they shouldn't care about GDP growth anymore. So pretty clearly the interests of shareholders and the interests of workers, from the sounds of what you're saying, uh, they're pretty different these days, aren't they? Yeah, I mean, I get it. You know, like I was the chief economist for an investment bank for 20 years. I get it that, you know, if you're a Magna shareholder or a GM shareholder, it's quite legitimate of you to ask management, why are we paying 20 to $30 an hour in Detroit or Oshawa when we can be paying two and a half dollars an hour in Mexico? And, you know, legitimate question to ask. But it seems to me that if I'm Christia Freeland, there's got to be some balance between the interests of Magna shareholders and the interests of the few Magna workers remaining in Canada. And that balance has been totally lost. And, and, you know, not just in this round of trade negotiations. That balance has been totally lost for the last 20, 30 years. And that's why the middle class is showing all the signs of extinction. The balance may be lost, but the question is, what can anybody do about it? For example, yeah, we, you just referenced Christian Freeland. Is it, is it possible for the finance minister to say to any company in this country, you know, I'm sorry, we're making it illegal for you to move your plant to Mexico. If you want to do business in Canada, you got to keep that plant here. Can you do that? No, you can't make it illegal, but you can do what Donald Trump said during the 2016 campaign to Ford when it was about to close a huge assembly plant and move it to Mexico. And he said, you can go ahead and do that, but if you do that, I'm slapping a 25% tariff on anything that you ship from that plant into the U.S. market. And lo and behold, Ford decided to cancel that plant and instead invest over $700 million in a refurbished plant in, Mexico, in Michigan, which in turn saved the jobs of 700 workers. If, if Donald Trump can do that, Christia Freeland can do that, but only if Christia Freeland is willing to value the jobs of Magna workers above the interests of Magna shareholders, because I'm sure that shareholders in Ford were not exactly thrilled when Donald Trump threatened them with a 25% tariff if they moved production to Mexico. Well, I was just going to say, how does Christia Freeland make that argument when she's on the other hand, complaining about all the tariffs that uh, Donald Trump is putting on Canada, many of them in the interests of so-called national security. Yeah, well, you know, may I remind Christia Freeland that Donald Trump offered a bilateral deal that would have excluded Mexico, which she rejected. So, you know, she's going to say she's representing the interests of Canadians. But I'm going to say, which Canadians? The plutocrats or the middle class? The trade deal that she signs serves the interests of the plutocrats. In other words, the owners of Magna, not the workers of Magna. At least not the Canadian or American workers. Maybe the Mexican workers. Well, as long as, long as we're on this subject, you know, Donald Trump made a lot of noise about the fact that the USMCA or the U.S.-Mexico-Canada trade agreement was a massive improvement on the North American free trade agreement, NAFTA. Do you share that view? Well, it is for American workers because he's coerced a lot of foreign investment into the U.S. auto industry when otherwise it wouldn't come. And I don't think it was so much the provisions of the U.S. and the United States, Mexico, Canada trade agreement, but the implicit, in fact, the explicit threat that if you don't boost investment and create jobs in the auto industry, I'm going to tariff anything that you want to sell into the U.S. market. 
Well, you know what? If it works for Donald Trump in the United States, it worked for Christia Freeland in Canada. We had a thing called the Auto Pack that worked just perfectly, that incidentally was later declared illegal by the World Trade Organization as anything else that was intended to help Canadian workers. And what it specified was that U.S. companies had to produce as much as they sold in Canada. <laughs> Not exactly the same cars. They would have a product mandate to produce a specific car for the whole North American market, hence achieve the economies of scale that globalization offered, but without the job losses. I wouldn't mind the auto pact re reimposed and you know if we would have played our cards a little bit differently and would have taken trump's offer of a bilateral deal and not worried about magna shareholders maybe we could have negotiated that well what you're describing is managed trade which basically spits in the face of the last 40 years which is towards freer trade uh, are you saying we need to swing the pendulum back the other way now well don't forget that freer trade is exactly what has impoverished the middle class? And maybe we should back up, Steve, so just that viewers understand the critical linkages here. I mean, why has the middle class disappeared? Primarily because of the type of uh, jobs that are being created, and more importantly, the type of jobs that are no longer being created. In the 1950s and 1960s, which was the heyday of the middle class in countries like Canada and the United States, middle class workers produced the very goods that they consumed. TVs, cars, dishwashers. They don't make those goods anymore. They're made on far off supply chains where labor gets a fraction of their wage. So all the jobs in the economy are on the service side. There hasn't been a single net job created on the good side of the Canadian economy in two decades. And the US would be exactly in the same boat. So why are those jobs no longer created? Because those jobs can be offshore to Mexico or China. Now, back in the 60s and 50s, there were even bigger wage advantages to going to China and Mexico than there are today. But if you did that, you wouldn't have a hope in hell of ever selling anything produced in those factories back to the countries where those jobs were coming from, because there were tariff walls. But rounds and rounds of GATT trade deals, later WTO trade deals, and then trilateral uh, trade deals like NAFTA, brick by brick, disassembled their tariff wall. And all of a sudden, middle class workers in Canada and the United States found themselves having to compete with sweatshops where wages were one-tenth the, their wage. And of course, if I'm a shareholder in any of those companies, I'm going to say we've got to take advantage. We've got to optimize profits given the trading environment that exists. So, you know, I mean, I don't want to villainize Magna or GM for doing what I would tell Magna and GM to do if I own shares in those companies. I, in I instead hold people like Christia Freeland accountable for signing trade deals that allows Magna and GM to, do to behave in that fashion. So just to finish that thought then, if we were to do it again, we, you would presumably suggest that Canada and the U.S. make a trade, a trade agreement and leave Mexico out of the deal this time? Absolutely. And you know what? The Canada-U.S. free trade deal worked just fine. And you know why it worked just fine? Because there was effective wage parity. I mean, we had, you know, a slight advantage on the exchange rate. We had public health care costs, so companies like GM wouldn't have to buy private plans. But we also had a more aggressive union. We had higher wages. So all in, it basically evened off that, you know, there was no huge economic incentive to massively shift production into Canada or vice versa because costs were basically equalized. Then you open a trade agreement to another country that has one ninth the per capita income of Canada and the United States and where the minimum wage is $2.50 a day. 
Well, you know, that's a whole other story. And, you know, Ross Perot was quite prophetic when he said back in the early 1990s about that giant sucking sound of jobs fleeing the United States into Mexico. And while at first you could only maybe produce the most rudimentary kind of products in these Macleodora plants, you know, give the Mexican labor force 30 years of experience, they can produce everything as intricate as transmissions and engines as you can but only at one-tenth the cost. So, yeah, that's the way things work in the global trading system that we have. If that argument is so as obvious as the noses on our faces, why did Canada include Mexico in the U.S.-Mexico-Canada trade agreement then? Well, dare I say that that was a very propitious move for many Canadian businesses who all of a sudden saw the opportunity to source supply chains at a fraction of the labor costs that they would have to pay in Canada and the United States. And I get back to the point, like if I'm a Magnus shareholder, I think Christia Freeland has done a fantastic job. But if I'm a Unifor worker, you know, I might have a little different view about her than their leader, Jerry Diaz, has. Hmm. You mentioned the World Trade Organization in one of your answers a few moments ago, and let me just follow up on that, because, uh, of course, China has seen tremendous growth over the last uh, several decades, and, and you've written in the book that it's partly because the World Trade Organization treats China as though it's still a developing nation, which it was when it joined the WTO almost two decades ago. Why does it continue to have that more favored treatment when clearly it's not the country today that it was 20 years ago? Well, I don't know, Steve. That's a very good question. <laughs> That's a question that Donald Trump has raised. Because let me tell you how it refers to autos. And let's not lose sight of the fact that it was President Bill Clinton, okay, right after the Seattle riots in 1999 when the WTO held their first trade meeting in the United States, who lobbied for China's inclusion into the WTO. Okay, if you're uh, trying to export autos, into the United States. The US has, under WTO rules, a most favored nation tariff rate of two and a half percent. If you are trying to export an auto into the United States, into China, China has, under the same WTO rules, the right to impose a 25% tariff, 10 times what the US is allowed to impose on car imports, because in the eyes of the WTO, China's a developing nation. The same China that in 10 years is forecast to have a GDP greater than the United States is continued to be deemed a, de a developing nation. So when you hear about the WTO talk about a rules-based trading order system. That sounds very appealing. It sounds like, you know, you've guarded yourself against the capriciousness of, of national politicians. But what you don't realize is there's different rules for different countries, and the WTO rules are designed to screw Canadian and U.S. workers. And you know what? The guy to call that out, the first guy to call that out, was Donald Trump, but as often gets lost in the liberal, neoliberal narrative of the day, is that Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump were exactly on the same page when it came to trade. And had not the elite of the Democratic Party conspired to keep Sanders off the ticket in 2016, just as they've done in 2020, and last week we saw how effective a strategy that was in the first debates, the fact is that if Bernie Sanders was in the White House, the U.S. would be having the exact same trade war with China, and Bernie Sanders would have demanded NAFTA to be renegotiated because he, too, argued like Donald Trump. It was a terrible deal for American workers, and in particular, American auto workers. Which just goes to show you, Steve, that populism, the much... You know, the much criticized populism, boogeyman populism, can hit from both sides of the plate. Oh, there's it no question. No, there's left wing, right wing. Yeah, there's no question about that. But but um, let me push back a bit on this a bit, Jeff, because I do remember before the last campaign, uh, 2016, when Trump was running for president the first time, and he went to Indiana to the carrier plant. And he said to all those folks who make air conditioning, you know, you put me in the Oval Office and I'm going to make damn sure this plant stays alive. And the fact of the matter is it made a great photo op, and then as soon as he left town,
the plant, you know, they, I think the company gave them a five minute victory and said, well, we're going to hang on to, instead of closing the plant, we'll, we'll hang on to some of these jobs. And the people thought, thank God, Donald Trump, he's our prophet, he saved the place. And then, of course, as soon as he skipped town, when he wasn't looking, they shut the thing down anyway. So I, I wonder if Donald's a bit of a false prophet on some of this. Well, let me push back on your comments. Sure. Maybe you've been watching a little too much CNN and not looking at the Labor Bureau statistics. Because if you you may well be right in that particular case. But a funny thing happened when Donald Trump got elected. Manufacturing employment, which hasn't grown in 20 years, all of a sudden to grow, started to increase. And it started to increase in the very industries that all of a sudden had huge tariff protection, like aluminum, steel, and autos. Is that a coincidence? Or is there maybe a functional causal relationship between applying tariffs and keeping production and investment home and increasing manufacturing employment? And God forbid, maybe these folks will even get a real wage increase for the first time in 50 years. So if your point is Donald Trump has spewed some BS and many of his promises didn't come to fruition, fine. But here's the bigger picture. Manufacturing employment is growing in the U.S., and I would contend as a very result of Donald Trump's trade policies, which I would acknowledge wouldn't be any different than Bernie Sanders' trade policies if he had been allowed to grab the nomination from the elite of the Democratic Party. Well, I'm all, that no, that's great, and I'm all about the empirically provable facts here, and I will, and I will endorse your empirically provable facts. In fact, in last week's presidential debate, one of the few mistakes Joe Biden made was to say to Donald Trump, manufacturing's gone down on your watch, which in fact was not the case. You are correct. The Labor Bureau stats uh, endorse what you have to say. However, um, you know, do, do you ever find it passing strange that you as a former CIBC chief economist are now finding yourself making arguments which sound a bit different than the arguments you might have made 20 years ago? Well, you know, my mind takes me to strange places. <laughs> but, um, you know, I do think it's a little bit ironic that an ex-managing director of an investment bank and an ex-chief economist of some renown on Bay Street for 20 years would be the person who has to tell Unifor members to connect the dots between plants closing in Oshawa and the kind of trade deals Christia Freeland is making. I would have thought perhaps internal guidance from Unifor would connect those dots, but so be it. If, if Donald Trump could be a spokesman for U.S. auto workers, I don't think I have any problem being a spokesman for Canadian auto workers. What do you think, Steve? Well, he's not really a Republican, right? So that's how he can make the argument, which is fine. He's and Oh, my. <laughs> okay. Um, well, okay, you have written in the book anyway that capitalists always seem to be the biggest supporters of immigration in the past because they saw new arrivals as cheap sources for labor for their factories. And now we see a situation where, where conservatives are, in the United States anyway, uh, quite supportive of much tighter immigration rules. Uh, liberals, ironically, are pushing for more open borders. And, and, you know, there is a chunk, certainly a chunk of the conservative movement in the States uh, whose anti-immigration stances uh, border on xenophobic. So help us understand all of that. Well, first of all, you got to understand why businesses have always, and this not just today, goes back 100 years ago with the Great Migration where 30 million Europeans migrated to the United States from 1850 to 1914. Why people like Andrew Carnegie called them a stream of gold. For the same reason that the Koch brothers today would, or the Business Council of National Issues in Canada was. They were always a source of cheap labor. Not only were they a source of their own cheap labor, but they had an impact on the wages of the native labor force. And I don't know if you ever saw, Steve, the Scorsese movie, Gangs of New York. It de deals with the pushback yep. from the native against Irish Catholic, okay? These were, by the way, you know, immigrants of the same color, same language, and, you know, close to the same religion. I mean, they were Christian, right? Uh, and you saw the kind of pushback. Well, there was a reason why there was pushback, because they had a negative impact on the wages 
of the native labor force. Not skilled trades. Ever since the medieval age, skilled trades have always protected their own through, you know, guilds. So it's not, you know, lawyers and doctors. You know, there's a there's a Royal Physician College of Physicians and, uh, you know, the Upper Canada Law Society that will protect the lawyers and, and physicians. But there's no college of unskilled labor that protects the interests and wages of unskilled workers. And they've typically been on the receiving end. And ironically, in the United States, it's been the black unskilled worker who has actually suffered the most from immigration. And that's not a new story because despite their so-called emancipation after the Civil War, there wasn't really a mass migration of ex-black slaves to the North until after World War I where all of a sudden the Immigration Act slashed immigration from like a million people to 150,000. So this is not a new phenomenon. I realize that in today's world, these are words that cannot be spoken. Nevertheless, they need to be said. Looks like I'm saying them. <laughs> and you just did. Jeff, <laughs> I have to say. Thank me for saying that. <laughs> so do you, but so be it. If that's what it takes to have an honest discussion of the issue, it's not what color, it's not what race, it's not what religion, it's how many. That's the issue. Now, the argument for, and you know, let me assure you, I'm not speaking for CIBC on this, or, or for that matter, uh, CG, but the argument pro-immigration is that with the demographics of a country like Canada, and indeed most OECD countries, we're not going to be able to expand the labor force because we don't replace you know, the birth rate. The birth rate doesn't replace us. So without growth in the labor force, how are we going to grow GDP? You know, but if I'm an expendable, why do I give a shit about GDP? I mean, I know that's a heretical thing to say for an economist, you know, particularly from a financial market background. But the implicit assumption here is that if GDP grows, I'm better off. Well, guess what? GDP's done just fine for the last 20 years. 80% of Canadian households haven't seen a real income gain, and real wages haven't grown since 90, 1975. So if someone tells me that the policies that Jeff Rubin is espousing is going to shrink the pie, and they probably would. If I'm an expendable, I'd say that's fine. Just cut me a larger slice. And if the pie isn't as large, it's the 1% who have engorged themselves on the spoils of growth who will notice that, not me. Jeff, I have to say, I always enjoy your visits on our program because the conversation gets lively and sparky. And I do love the way you push back. And we are happy to remind people that your latest is called The Expendables. How the middle class got screwed by globalization. Always enjoy our talks, Jeff, and uh, be well, okay? Good talking, Steve, and you're right. I, I think I need a haircut. <laughs>